Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to tonight's event. My name is Brett Ward. I'm the General Manager of International Marketing for Brickworks Building Products. And whether you're joining us here in Sydney or from anywhere across Australia, thank you for being with us this evening. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we all gathered and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Tonight is the very first event of our new In Detail speaker series, where we invite industry professionals to connect over an evening of insightful conversation. We hope that you find this new event format to be engaging, thought-provoking and entertaining. As part of our desire to support the architectural community, we'll be working very hard to bring you a range of diverse topics and speakers from across Australia and the world for this new series. I'm excited to say that we're very close to securing a speaker from Barcelona for the 17th of September, so please watch this space. I'd like to extend a very big thank you to tonight's guest presenter, Mr. Alec Zanis. Alec is no stranger to Australia's architectural community, having won the Institute of Architects' highest honour in 2018. I'm also delighted to welcome our good friend, design aficionado, Mr. Tim Ross, who will be managing tonight's hosting duties. Tim will be joined later by architect, writer and educator, Mr. Stephen Varity, who will undertake a Q&A session with Alec at the conclusion of his presentation. And finally, I'm very excited to announce that Brickworks has recently launched a new website, Daily Architecture News. Please make sure to go to dailyarchitecturenews.com and subscribe for all the latest insights and information regarding architecture and design from across Australia and the world. And now it gives me great pleasure to welcome Tim and Alec for tonight's first in detail speaker event. Please enjoy your evening, thank you. Thank you, Brett. Wonderful to be here and um, a big hello to people who are watching the live stream and um, we should have a particular shout out to our friends in Melbourne and we're thinking of you uh, at this moment in time. Um, it's terrific to be here and what will become hopefully not known as, as the Brickworks Cluster. Um, <laughs> things happen. Thanks for your support, ladies and gentlemen, particularly at home. Uh, uh, it's really great to have Alec here um, for this chat um, and I know you, you're going to love what he has to share. Um, Alec has, has served the community in a number of roles, including the, the National President of the Australian Institute of Architects, which he told me uh, beforehand that was a glamorous but a bit of a ball ache. Um, <laughs> he was also the Professor of Practice and Dean of the University of New South Wales Built Environment and in 2018. Uh, as Brett said, he was awarded the gold medal, which is a fantastic recognition of a wonderful career. Um, it's wonderful to have you here. Thank you so much for spending some time. Was it? A, what was that process like being the president? I presume it wasn't a ball like for you. Well, it, it's um, it's 2006. Uh, oh, sorry. Five, six, and so things have changed a lot since then. Um, in those days, the um, institute had a very different environment, uh, much more financial stability, and of course, it was. Um, still is the um, underpins the, the profession uh, right now involved with the building commissioner reg on the regulations controlling building and, and advocating for you know, fairer and more reasonable sort of conditions for everybody in the trade so and in the profession so I think it's a good place. Good to hear. Before we get you to have a chat I do have a, a few questions and then Stephen uh, will ask you a few questions after your presentation. Um, it's, I think it's important to go back to the start and was there a defining moment for you or someone that you met that inspired you to become an architect? Yes, there was a defining moment because I, um, I took um, art in my final two years of school, um, dropping subjects that were normally in school or that considered to be more scholarly. And I read a book uh, called Space, Time and Architecture by Gideon. And, and I knew from that moment that I wanted to be an architect from, from what was in the book and from my leanings towards that area of design. Do you, would you imagine yourself as an artist? Um, I have imagined myself as an artist, but um, as an artist, I'm a better architect. <laughs> How would you describe your design philosophy? Well, um, I think design's a very interesting way to spend a life. And I would say the main reason for doing things as a designer is to make a better world through design. And so it's an outward focus. It's, it, it aims to be socially relevant and aims to um, contribute to making a better planet. And right now, the challenges we face 
are enormous and I think we can make a difference as designers. Yeah, which leads me on to, uh, to the next question, which is we're in a strange time. How can, how can design assist us in this, in this time? Well, uh, uh, I think we have to reconnect with um, the primary reasons why we do things and uh, as a designer connect with our precepts, our values and uh, our thinking. And I think design's always uh, most interesting when it connects with major social change. So the Bauhaus is an obvious example, it's not the only one. And right now I think we're understanding that the future is not the past and I think it provides opportunity for us to rethink what design is about and how it can contribute to giving expression to new values, new ways of working, new ways of thinking and being and how to design for it. How, how, what sort of conversations have been happening within your practice about how things are changing and, 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 and how it's affecting what you design? Well, we have a lot of conversations in our practice. We have a collaborative practice um, and we share our thoughts with our, our entire team um, regularly. COVID's made it more uh, electronic, let's say. Um, so we think about how we can uh, behave ethically towards each other, how we can extend the way we um, work within our practice to our relationships with our clients. And we also think about how uh, design opportunity is not only an opportunity for our clients, but also an opportunity for them and us to uh, see how we can make you know, something better for, for the uh, people who aren't the clients of the building, so the, the greater public good, if you like. We'll have a lot of people who are here or watching the stream who you will be a design hero for. Yeah. Who are some of your design heroes? Well, there are many. So where do you want to start? Um, I could start with the Italians, and I love contrasting Brunelleschi, the sublime rationalist and mathematician with Borromini, who was, you know, centuries later, but also incredibly good spatially. If you go locally, it's, it's very hard to avoid the impact of Utzon and, and the way in which he evolved different solutions for different parts of the world and different problems. So uh, we talk a lot about that in our practice, to go back to your early question, which is uh, how we, we, we think of things from first principles and not from the point of view of doing the same thing again and again. So Utzon, I think, is in many ways an inspiration uh, for, for that sort of work. But where else can we go? Um, uh, 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 Burnham, Daniel Burnham, who did the Chicago plan and very underestimated as an architect because he also did the Flatiron Building. Now we love the Flatiron Building and we also know the Chicago plan uh, underpinned the enormous uh, power of that city and made it the great city it was from, from 1880 onwards. And Daniel Burnham, I think, was a pragmatist um, a very uh, quiet sort of person and extremely gifted and, and yet not, not highly known in our profession. So I, I don't want to spend the whole night on the heroes, but there's many. That's good to hear. The, um, I was thinking about your, your famous Henwood House, one of your first projects from 1988, and it's a, it's a building that people still talk about. What's your relationship with your back catalogue of work? How do you look at it? Are you oh. looking forward or you, how, do you look, how do you think about it? Well, you know, like Janice, you look forward and you look back. And, and the back, the looking back and help you look forward, um, it should always be considered in context. And so the context has changed. I don't think you can use a solution from the past uh, directly in the future very often. But the Henwood House was, um, if you like, a pass on from, from, uh, from Glenn Merkin, in fact, who said that, um, you know, I think probably sick of Willara Council and gave it to me. So it was a, a challenging project. Uh, for me, the main thing about it was that you could, um, you could make a beautiful building out of a terrace lot and it would have um, high ceilings, um, a spatial um, continuity from front to back that gave it a sense of scale. It had, although it faced in the wrong direction, it brought winter sun back into the courtyard uh, at the rear and, and delivered amenity um, that wasn't available in terrace houses. So um, I, I would say that um, the challenge at that time was the codes required you to do um, the houses that were next door. And I couldn't understand that because they were spec built, they were uh, virtually not designed and they were terrible. And so I couldn't understand why you'd want to do the house next door. 
um, and, and uh, looking at Palladio's terrace, looking at John Soane's uh, terrace in London, you could see what you could do with terrace houses. And, and we could do a three-storey terrace in a two-storey street, produce, um, I think, 200% more FSR and higher ceilings and more sunlight mm. and everything else just by design. I want to talk about the gold medal and what did it, what did it mean to you and what does it mean to you? Well, all those awards um, are really um, not why I get up to go to work for, but they are a great privilege to receive. I don't want to underestimate them. And in particular, the gold medal um, comes at a point in, in my life which um, really, I, I suppose, reflects all the people um, that I've worked with because the, the practical reality of doing larger buildings is that it's collaborative and it's teamwork. So it's, um, it is um, a reflection on, on the practice, uh, not just me, and it also is probably good to have these sorts of things because it brings focus um, on design and perhaps design excellence. And so it, I guess it is meaningful and, it, and I shouldn't underestimate it, but um, you know, I'm not big on awards. We have literally over 100 on, so <laughs> perhaps, perhaps we, shouldn't, we shouldn't be too um, coy about it. But at the same time, um, every new project is um, a challenge and looking back um, and seeing that pretty much everything that we've done, we stand by. We absolutely stand by. They're all, they're all good in their own way. And I think yeah, that's what I would say. Um, I think a lot of people are going to learn a lot from your presentation tonight. But um, final question I have for you is if you have a piece of advice to an emerging architect who's watching tonight, what would that be? Well, in COVID-19 times, the advice may not be as practical as it used to be, but I would say... Uh, look carefully and, and experience um, what interests you uh, with your own eyes and your own feelings and your own mind. Um, certainly read widely, certainly look carefully at others through magazines and other media, but I think you have to f form your own view. Understand the values you have and what you want to do in life and see how that passion can become uh, the reasons why you design. But the reason why I say that is because too often, I think um, a virtual experience isn't um, as, as, uh, as you expect when you experience it. And I, I learned this when I first uh, began to look at architecture, that I would have these favorite buildings and I'd go up and I'd say, well, it's not what I expected. It's, it's either worse or better, but it wasn't what I expected. So I think it's important to get behind the representation of things and understand it carefully and learn carefully from that direct experience. Well, good advice there for, uh, for emerging architects. It's time for your presentation, so um, can we please give him a round of applause while he makes his way to the lec lectern? Thank you, Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Tim, and particularly thank you, Brickworks, for putting on the in-detail speaker series. It's really important for us that you've generously supported this series because we have this conversation. We have it nationally, and I understand internationally, and it makes us feel as though we're part of a community and that we share the same ambitions to make a better world, as I've just been talking about. And I really, really thank Brickworks for this um, for this series for all of, for all, from all of us. So I've titled this um, uh, presentation of projects, if you like, um, Architecture for Sydney, because I want to talk about uh, place-specific design. I also want to touch on what might be a new design era. I say that because of what we just talked about, and that is we're in a place globally where the past is definitely not the model that I think we should be taking to the future. And what does that mean? How is, it, how is it affecting us as designers? And I'm going to say that it reconnects us with social purpose. It reconnects us with design of substance deep design. And I think it reconnects us with science so that we build buildings 
It's still delight, but nevertheless, a more sustainable and more enduring. So with that, I'll outline what we'll talk about. Uh, Darling Quarter, that you know very well, of course, uh, by Lendlease, um, and in, a, in collaboration with Lendlease Design. Baron Grew South, which is three projects that uh, Bob Nation's in the room, and I'm going to thank him straight away for guiding us throughout that process and contributing to the design success. And again, that was for Lendlease. Uh, 71 Macquarie Street, which started off with AMP Movac and went to Macrolink and Landream in collaboration with Crone Arctics. And the Martin Place Metro Precinct, which is an urban design project and connected with that 39 Martin Place, uh, again in collaboration with, um, with uh, um, Integrated Solutions, uh, the building that came out of that urban design project. So they are the projects. And let me say straight away that in Darling Quarter, the primary directors in charge are in this room, Ben, ben Green and Chi Mellon, who, who did the vast amount of the work on this project. And of course, others who, who worked with them in our team. So it's about how ordinary buildings, I call them ordinary buildings, they're, they're mass housing, they're large apartment buildings, um, can make a place. And most importantly, how I think brickwork has gone from what I used to say, and this is not very nice thing to say, but basically a square metre trade, square metre rate trade, in other words, it had no art to it, to a material that we can engage with and which we can use to extend our expressive potential as architects and to make the buildings far more beautiful as a result of the way Brickworks has enhanced our language and opportunity. So the site is um, to the south of Darling Harbour. Um, there's an undercroft to the expressway which connects you to Dar Darling Harbour. And why did we choose bricks? Well, we chose bricks for their natural properties, their sustainability, the fact that they go for centuries. But we also thought it was appropriate because in that precinct, the best buildings were brick buildings. They were the oldest buildings and they were the most beautiful buildings. And we were the only architects who chose brick for this large development. And we think that it's the right solution to associate new work with things that people loved from the past. But in this slide, there's something I want to touch on, which is the work of Gary. Now, there is nothing that takes away uh, the great accolades that Frank Gehry and his team have achieved. I think he's contributed enormously to extending the language of architecture. But I think it is architecture, if I may say, in the past, primarily because the brickwork here won't weather well and is, is supported by a scaffold of stainless steel which has an 80-year life. And one of the things that I'd like to touch on is how we can make buildings that still delight, still engage emotionally, still uh, bring smiles to people's faces that Gary sometimes achieves, often achieves, but are more sustainable and not just about the gesture, not just about the shape and, and, and more about uh, the substance of design, the deep design that I talk about. And here is, here is the, the great story of this building because you know, over 70 bricks would, were used, different shapes, different colours and glazes. Uh, all supported by Brickworks to create our language, to help the buildings take their form. On the left, you see our inspiration, the toothed brickwork of different glazes and colours. You can see how the slabs, the parapets, the openings, the re-entrance um, in different glaze to emphasise the form and the monumental entry points with another curved glass brick, how the brick becomes part of the language of the building and uses the, the ideas of the architecture to make them visible, as they did in the past. And again, just bricks as, as balusters to, to achieve privacy or to combine bricks with other materials, in this case a unit construction with liquid forms of concrete so that the buildings can uh, enhance their uh, vocabulary with, with the juxtaposition of different materials. And that was done in the past. You can think of all those great English buildings in Chelsea, which are stone and brick. And again, not using bricks, but still continuing part of the language. In this case, a tall building, 42 storeys, concrete frame, a singular building, but in its form, identifying the differences between the street on the left with the curved shape and the fact that it connects to another part of the development on the right. So in a subtle way, the tower form, um, if you like, indicates the urban qualities and gives you an identity from a distance in the urban space of what's beyond.
Just to quickly run through this, the, the urban strategy, not a lot that we don't do, uh, everybody strives to do in this higher level of practice. So it is a car park, basically, at ground level. What I mean by that is we couldn't go down um, too costly. And what, what had to happen is to activate the uh, um, public domain. So all around the car park are retail and entry points and disguised service and car park entries. And so the public domain in all of its uh, forms has been reinforced by different types of retail um, and other activities to enhance the activation of the precinct and to make it a desirable place to go. And as you go up, again, the car park within the podium is sleeved by apartments. And again, when you reach the top of the podium, mostly over the apartments, the tower elements start. And the podium itself is designed so that people who enjoy it enjoy every part of the adjacent conditions to the north and west across the communal pool, uh, to the east connecting to Harbour Street, the largest space to the south, looking south, but also onto the lane systems and, of course, the building and the, and the square to the, to the west proper. And when we, when we look at the section, you can see the car park and you can see how we've sleeved the car park and you can see very closely, if you look at the ground plane, left with a taller retail for the more important public space and the lower retail for the less important part, public space. And when, when we look at the design of the building, we often think carefully about how we can make the ground plane interesting, but also that important moment when a building uh, meets the sky, that opportunity to change the building, to celebrate that moment, to give it a different character, which we've done in these buildings. And you can see in this elevation, uh, with the square elevation, the re-entrance to articulate different parts of the building, and also the communal area on the left with the landscape and the sky homes on the right. Again, this juxt and the retail, of course, at the bottom, which again on the tower, you can see the continuation of the podium, and you can also see in the middle a special little building which becomes the major entry for, the, for both of the taller buildings, left and right. And when you look at that building, again, this is one development with a unified language across the whole lot, but with special parts to break the enormous scale of the building up into moments that reflect adjacent urban conditions and give memorable character to the building and, and this, in this way, uh, the major uh, monumental entry, the curving forms of the brickwork, the re-entrance against the tower on the right, and the simpler language and the more uh, intricate brick language of the lower tower on the left, which you see here as the building curves to connect the public spaces, bend the light into the street, and also when you look the other way south, where you see the castellated top, where the building breaks down in scale and, and creates a different character, even though the podium continues, and of course references more directly the building's opposite in brickwork. And here you see the use of brickwork to disguise uh, natural ventilation above the lower scale retail on the lane, and, and of course in a V shape to accentuate depth and disguise the open uh, uh, open uh, air uh, access required for the car park and the use of the tooth white brickwork everywhere we want to articulate building form. And to, to conclude almost this building, um, why did we take um, a, a singular, simple language to the tower? And it's partly because the, the area is quite complex in its built form and let me say quite um, undesigned in the sense of um, plenty of um, elements that come around buildings which don't have a very uh, attractive character. We thought that in this complexity, something uh, striking and simple would stand out and, and define the new precinct as being different to the, to the kind of context that you see in the foreground. And so our buildings, of course, following the master plan, complete the low scale and open space and also, uh, also um, contrast with the Kengo Kuma um, idiosyncratic and, if you like, monument in the space. So it's a backdrop, it's an urban building, it's an infill building, if you like, and, and like the best apartment buildings in Sydney, in, typically in brick, uh, designed to be low maintenance, enduring, 
and, and the basic fabric of the city, that, that um, if you get the housing right, you can make a beautiful city. Now, our opinions are important, but reasonably low key. So the next projects are around Barangaroo, the south part of Barangaroo, the first precinct to be developed, and there'll be three projects, um, the West Podium, International House Sydney, and Daramu House, which are all land lease projects. Um, and the West, po po West Podium is um, an interesting project because it was designed to screen and provide an urban scale to the three, for those who don't know it, um, it'll be difficult, to the three towers that are all basically the same rotating of different heights by um, Roger Stirk Harbour Partnership. And what we had was 1,200 millimetres to, um, to sheathe this, these three towers and to create a 45 metre 45 meter high podium buildings, they were called, 1,200 millimetres deep, uh, 45 metres high, to give it the urban scale. And here is an early uh, CGI of the proposition that Lendley's had, the urban proposition, which was to have five architects do the podia. So on the right is our initial concept for Tower 3 in masonry. And, and this is the west. On the east side of this, Hassel had the podium. On the left is Roger Stoke Harbour Partnership, who had both sides in the tower. And the, the tower not in view to, to the far left out of the picture is Tower 1, which was uh, Tony Kerr Associates and PTW. So each of these architects were delivering uh, different languages, but on a masonry theme initially. And our proposal um, took the 1,200 millimetres entirely at times to develop robust masonry buildings. But the backstory is that we took away too much floor space. We were only allowed 600 millimetres. So I proposed that the more important site was the East Podium and that we would sacrifice the, um, the, the masonry thickness and do a skin building so that it allowed the East Building to be uh, given the appropriate dimension for what I think a good masonry building should have. So we did a skin, a skin building. And this is the skin building, uh, the first of the buildings at Barangaroo, which bent, bent the corners, used louvers to give low iron glass, uh, subtly integrated uh, services in the vertical louver that you see. By coincidence, um, uh, the Barangaroo Development Authority placed our furniture in the foreground on the right, which has that same sort of sense of liquid form that um, also, also we tried to dematerialise. So here we're sitting under the awning uh, with uh, polished stainless steel, which takes you inside, reflects and refracts, and disguises where things start and stop. And also the idea, which wasn't in the brief, but which I think was questionable in the brief, was that you were hiding, you had to hide the towers, but we didn't hide the tower. We thought the tower's vertical presence with its vertical fins uh, could complement our horizontal building with the horizontal fins to be in a kind of dialogue. So we think, we think that's important, that if it is a big building, you can't hide it and you can do something with it. But uh, our buildings that um, are probably more relevant to tonight are the timber buildings that followed. And uh, again, I have to acknowledge uh, Jonathan Evans, we, with whom I uh, collaborated uh, for this building and who leads our timber technology section. And uh, with Jonathan, we, we developed International House Sydney a low carbon building, a new aesthetic, if you like, using timber, um, developing prefabrication, which means remote prefabrication, another country, and getting it almost to the, le well, to the level of industrial design for it to fit together. And that gives you the clue to the last statement. It's about disassembly as much as assembly, because of course timber sequests carbon. And if you then burn it or throw it away and it rots, it brings the carbon back. So it must be forever using it forever. So we had two buildings in the end, and they are the gateway to the, to the south from Hickson Road, and also, in a sense, from the north to the south. And the first of these buildings um, was the experiment in timber. And I also have to acknowledge straight away Jeremy Thompson from Lendley's, who is a champion for this proposal, who um, basically disliked concrete for sustainable reasons and wanted this timber building. 
and and with the, uh, if you like the, the budget that we had, we were inspired to do the most economical building we could do, and to that end we we developed a nine by six structural grid in which you dropped the pallets of CLT into the glue lamb beams and columns. And we thought that was a beautiful thing to express in the building with low iron glass, employing again a horizontal louver to, to uh, drop the solar load. And then we took recycled timbers to take the vertical loads clearly through to the colonnade in the tree-like form that you see in these timbers that were bought by Len Lease from a demolished bridge in Queensland as well as the timbers from the Barangaroo Wharves. This was iron bark that forms those columns. And the turpentines from the Barangaroo Wharf, which lined uh, a lot of the building. So this was one of the stories for the building. That is that we are recycling timber wherever possible. And we do that for very good reasons. Uh, that, that it is carbon neutral. And here I'm going to <clears throat> comment that successive federal governments have missed an opportunity. And that opportunity was not missed by the Austrian government that more than 20 years ago invested in timber forests, that with Forest Stewardship Council certification meant that the trees were grown in a sustainable way, even failed to minimise uh, the harm to the environments of living beings and certified to be sustainable in their production. And here we have 2,400 cubic metres of glue lamb, about 900 cubic metres of CLT, um, and the glue lambs sometimes have L LVL in it, 150 cubic metres of recycled hardwood, which is about 1,800 spruce trees. Now think of this. In a six-hectare forest, which for those who know Sydney is about 10% less than the area of Central Park, so quite a small area, you can grow the materials that made this building in two and a half hours out of Australian pine. So that is a very important thing to understand compared to the opposite, which is if you use Portland cement and steel, which produces carbon instead of storing carbon, um, it takes longer to build and does a lot more damage. In fact, the timbers carry about 60% of their material is carbon and they um, store about 70 to 90 tonnes of carbon per hectare and they take up about four tonnes of carbon in a fast-growing stand. And also, the uh, waste becomes a biomass energy generation. So compared to Portland cement and steel, with all the other environmental measures that Lend Lease took in these buildings, which includes tool beam technology, PVs, uh, um, heat exchange in the harbour, and a few other techniques, we think this building is about 50% uh, uh, less carbon emissions than a typical concrete building being tested uh, by some research at the university. And so to the main point, we design differently. We have to design everything uh, for a machine to make, to be loaded, put onto site and craned in the order that it's assembled so that it can be disassembled. And that is a challenge and involves high technology in drawing and, and other skills. To run through the building quickly, of course the colonnade was set by, by the master plan and defended by, by Bob, I must say, and beautifully executed as a result of that because there's pressure when you do a big colonnade to not make it that big. And of course we have retail all the way, but the main thing here is that the master plan was not um, successful in one respect because it had where the lane is between these two buildings they had proposed a commercial building on the left and a commercial building on the right. And both those commercial buildings had about an 800 uh, metre footprint, neither, neither building being commercially viable. So we proposed to assemble the two sites, make it into one site with uh, a new civic space between the two and a new square to the right and delivering a 1,200 square metre footprint, which was commercially viable. So that was the urban move that uh, we made. And here we see the nine by six grid. And if you look closely at the perimeter where there's more columns, that's actually a section through the K bracing to stabilize the timber. At the time, this was the tallest uh, commercial timber building uh, in the world. And of course, the timber extends the cores, the toilets and the fire escapes. And you see this in this 
uh, in these sections. The mezzanine floor is supported by concrete. The rest is timber. On the left, the uh, elevators, middle typical, and on the right, the fire escapes. And so we gave um, this timber, the iron bark recycled timber, its expressive purpose. I think um, it is like a tree. I know that's an obvious analogy to make, but it's a beautiful thing. And we brought it back down to the base in CNC styrene uh, formwork and we turned the rectangular forms into the liquid forms that you can make with concrete and expressed all the forces uh, directly into the ground and of course secured the length of the timber by not having any timber in, that can't take the weather uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the weather and also nothing touching the ground. And again, these are the two civic spaces, the square on the left, the underpass with its magnificent scale going through to the um, harbour and the clear glass with the louvers required only where they're needed and the K-bracing behind the louvers. Now there's another backstory. I've told you the backstory about, about, um, about the facade and the uh, floor space ratio. Uh, to lend least credit, credit, they pushed on with this building when it could not be sold to anyone or leased to anyone. And you know the business model is to not commence construction unless it's sold or leased. Um, the the uh, investment market had a 30-year financial horizon and they basically said, we're not investing. It's going to burn if it doesn't burn. It's going to rot. If it doesn't rot, the termites will get it. This is not a good investment. That was fairly predictable. But what was unpredictable was that the tenant market at the price land lease wanted to, to rent it uh, said that it's just not good value. This is a terrible interior pretty ugly building and we're not paying that price. And um, we're, we were a bit shocked by that. So um, the second building, while we were doing the first building, which was supposed to be a timber building, stopped with us and became a concrete building. When the building was, ah, the important point is that Lendlease pressed on. They created another company with a firewall to Lendlease with new investors in it and they indemnified lend lease for five years of rent. Now that was the big move because this building became a success and showed the market that you could build timber buildings and sell them or rent them. But meanwhile, we were off the case for the second building. It was going ahead designing concrete and the first building was building built. Not till the very end did they get one tenant and they realised they could have leased it three times over, and so they recommissioned us to do building number two in timber. So that is the uh, great contribution that Lendlease made. And this is the second building. How do you make uh, the sibling of the first, make it sufficiently different, and at the same time use all the knowledge from the first building? Well, we made it different because it's in a different uh, urban situation. And and I'll come back to that in a moment. We also made it different because the colonnade allows you to experience different types of experiences under it. So, of course, it adds FSR, but we had uh, the mezzanine becoming a full floor to the edge and the timber starting above that and expressed in that way. So the timber supports timber, the concrete supports concrete. And typically, we had in this building a lot more uh, stuff to put in, the car parks, a lot more services, but we still had north and south components of retail and we were able to achieve a through side foyer. So we connected Hickston Road to the lane in the foyer. And we were able to do uh, a 1,200 uh, mil, uh, square metre plate, which was uh, more viable. Now, the reason why the building's bent at the end in this boomerang shape is because opposite is, is, is the Renzo Piano Tower. And we wanted to experience beyond the tower by, by twisting the view to the northeast of the city and to the northwest to the harbour and also create a special um, condition uh, reflective of the triangular geometry of the building adjacent and also the idea that this is the start of the precinct or the end of the precinct. So um, I'll just concentrate on, on how we enrich this language we were able to use spotted gum to provide the solar control at the lower storey and turn it into the two-storey high foyer with the strong timber columns um, and the sculptural ceiling and soffit 
and also use CNC technology. Nicole Larkin, an artist and architect in our practice, designed this work of art using the same technology of the building to show the different shorelines uh, through the ages of this building. And we, we experimented with a different grid to make it more economically viable, or not viable, to make it basically cheaper, because it was viable, a, tw a nine by nine grid, which increased the size of the, the pallet of uh, CLT and increased the speed of construction. We used the same uh, technologies, chill beam and, and other things, but we were able to clean up the services by a different arrangement of the soffits, so there's less services um, visible at this point in time. And here's an example of the timber fire stairs with the hardwood treads. And also we were able to fully implement uh, a PV roof and use landscape primarily to provide um, heat island cooling, which increases the efficiency as we know by about 15% and also looks very nice when you look down onto it. So I'm having trouble with this one. Ah. So to conclude um, this building, so it does respond to the, to the build form. You can see how it turns you to the harbour. You can see the episodal moments of how it becomes an exciting building, if you like, to look at. And the V-shaped form, which takes you away from the view opposite and gives more privacy to the residents and a, a, a wider window to the views um, east and west. Now, 71 Macquarie Street. Um, a very um, important building for us, um, under construction, um, seamlessly done in collaboration with Ben Green, um, Macrolink, as I said, and um, Landream. And we had the project of completing Circular Quay East or East Circular Quay. And, and so you can see we're just the first building to the north of the Carl Expressway to that route to one of the world's great buildings and quite a quite an important responsibility to create some sort of way that you can say you've arrived somewhere and you're going somewhere special, that this ends the journey or starts the journey from somewhere special. And one of the clues was Utzen, Utzen's use of concrete as a finish to the structure, to express the structure, beautifully designed by Ovarup, but to express that structure um, in the architecture. And it's a theme that I think he started which was carried on to probably its greatest finesse with Nervi uh, working in, in one of Harry Sardis' finest buildings, I think, Australia Square, this gorgeous representation of the forces that take from the core to the column um, the, the structural loads. And so we have that in this building. Our soffits for the colonnade and for the through side link are that, but also the transformation of the colonnade into um, the structural logic of transferring the loads down to the ground. So the columns change as they move through in section, which you'll soon see. Before I do, do that, you, you'll find this is the basic building, about 17 to 20 storeys above ground, about seven to nine storeys below ground, and importantly, a proposition of connecting Macquarie Street to East Circular Quay, connecting a dignified, quiet, elegant street with a monumental but low scale, relatively low scale entry to a vigorous dynamic uh, space in the harbour of Sydney, the, the harbour that is to a, a very dynamic part of Sydney. And here is a, a section that explains that in the two arrows, this change of scale through the true side link and shows you uh, the suffete, the structural uh, expression of the suffete and the way the columns haunch to take, pick up the beams and become, if you like, the architecture of the building. And we, we used glass, I mean, the views are magnificent, we used glass everywhere, but we did it in a different way. We had curved glass experimenting with radii down to 1500 millimetres and opaque and translucent glass to allow these bay windows to become the divisions of the apartments. This is a low floor with the maximum yield, if I can put it that way. So it's got the most of those bay windows. But also we tilted the building to the view on the top of the page, views across to the Opera House and the Botanic Gardens, and a much calmer geometry to the bottom of the slide, where it's much more vigorous and views across the harbour and a very big re-entrant to the adjoining building, smaller one on, on the top of the page. And so here is uh, 
the building's under construction here are the drawings uh, which we prepared to show what the building's like it's pretty much like this with the structural soffit to the through side link the termination of the colonnade in in a retail edge which screens some pretty awful undercroft and then this um, more liquid form of column concrete and glass which you see mm, i do have trouble sometimes uh, which you see in this uh, in this visualization where the stone and the concrete and the glass seamlessly change from the material changes but the forms become interlocked and, and expressive in the same sort of ways. And also with the landscape, the palm trees will be coming back, they're fully cared for, and, and we've arranged them to align with the column grid um, to further enhance that connection to the open space beyond and to integrate with the building form. And you can also see that the upper floor of the columnar is occupied. So when we look at Macquarie Street, um, at this view, it's, it's a continuation of these grand residences, um, largely glass uh, uh, to, uh, in this block, more solid from a different era, era to the blocks further south. And when you look from the uh, circular quay side, it becomes more vigorous and more vital and connecting to the public domain through the change of language. So again with Ben Green, um, seamlessly doing an urban design project that led to architecture, we had um, a question around the planning and urban design of Martin Place and, and, and Chifley Square and the spaces between um, to, to, if you like, accommodate a massive investment in rail transport with the Martin Place Metro becoming a precinct. And we, we, we made it a precinct through urban design and leading out of that, um, 39 month place again our client Macquarie Bank and being built by Len Lease or Macquarie Holdings I should say being built by Len Lease and in association with integrated solutions in the delivery process so here is the site it goes from south of Martin Place all the way to Chifley but it has our site on the bottom of this slide to the right in in the small box 39 Martin Place opposite the magnificent Ross and Rowe building from 1925 to 1929, uh, the Depression era. Let me say two buildings about 100 years apart in similar circumstances. And then, of course, added to and brilliantly modified by Johnson, Pilton and Walker, who also had the, the building design project to the north onto Hunter Street, and of course, Grimshaw doing the station infrastructure underneath. So it's three architects working collaboratively and we are leading the design. Now, Martin Place has a long history of extremely contested planning and design propositions, but we all agree that the Cenotaph area between Pitt and George Street has some of the most magnificent stone buildings in the country, including Barnett's former GPO building, which I think is one of the great buildings in the world for that era. And it is flat, and it is our symbolic and ceremonial heart. Um, and very contained. But also Martin Place was the historic centre of commerce for Sydney, where the big banks like the Ross and Rowe Bank located, where other banks like the Reserve Bank of the nation is located, and which of course Barangaroo and other places try to relocate as a commercial heart. And our job partly was to not so much take away from any other place, but to reaffirm it as a commercial heart. And the question was, did the developer controls uh, do this? Uh, did they respond to uh, a different proposition um, about the infrastructure investment and what the city would be like? And our feeling was that it, was, that it didn't. And what underpinned the development controls um, was pretty good thinking, but uh, uh, thinking from a different era. Now, let me say right away that we basically agreed with something like 95% of the controls. We didn't agree with two things. The floor space, and the envelope, two big things, but there are only two things. Um, so the, the, the controls were developed from this thinking, where the width of the street was in a proportional relationship to the height of the buildings around a golden mean, and where the height of a podium was established between, on this drawing, 45 and 53 metres. It became 45 and 55 metres as the standard zero setback podium. And also that there should be a solar access plane, which we agreed with. And what we didn't agree with, which you see on the bottom line, is that there should be a 40 metre setback 
from the podia so that you could not see any high building beyond. Now, the council, when looking at this research and design proposition, didn't quite agree with that and made it a 25 metre setback, but also a six to eight metre side setback, um, which, you saw, which you see, wow, that was exciting, I apologise. <laughs> I didn't think I hit it that hard. Um, which you see in these diagrams, the podiums, the 40 metre setback and the two dotted lines. Now, when we analyse the place, and remember, it's a historic place, so these controls should, should really support new work that gives the character that is desired, reflecting the character of the past. We agreed with the zero setback podium. Um, what you see in red on the south side of Martin Place are only three examples of non-compliance with that existing characteristic. One, the Reserve Bank, another MLC building, and of course the building that we are demolishing to build our new building. On the plan below, the blue line represents the 25 metre setback. Um, and and uh, what you see here in red uh, diagonals are buildings that don't comply with that setback. And there are other buildings that are outside of that setback as well, that don't even register. And then what you see interestingly in green are two buildings at the top, which have a, a diagonal red and green that were approved by the City Council, not complying with their own controls. Two significant buildings, and for very good reasons. And also you see a building by the author of the controls, which does comply, no surprise. So we, we asked ourselves, why the 25 metre setback? It doesn't exist. The character of Martin Place is not formed by the envelope. We also noticed that in fact the podia aren't 45 to 55 metres, not that we objected to that. They were zero setback, but what you see is a blue line of 45, a red line of 55, and almost nothing within that, within that, um, within that uh, zone. So this, this we would say is designed by scenography, by a vision of beauty, not by an understanding from first principles of what constitutes the merits of a place and what can change to make it better. So we did our first principles urban analysis, which we often break up, depending on the project, we often break up into three components because together they are the city. The first two, movement and open space, really are the public domain. The third one often pays for the public domain in our neoliberal economy, which is the built form. And our proposition today is different to the past and different to the planning controls. We say we must design the most beautiful, livable, amenable public domain, and we should reverse engineer the built form to maximise the use of the land. Why do we say that? Because we want to stop urban sprawl and we want to make our cities exquisite. And so the difference here, to give you the end story, is the city had 12.51 is a maximum floor space ratio with all their setbacks, and we achieved 22.5 to 1 and 18.5 to 1 and greater public amenity. So that's what our proposition is. The planning controls were wrong. They weren't wrong yesterday, yesterday. they were wrong today and for the future. So I'll give you a snapshot of some of the analysis and be aware that it's a 300 page analysis, so you're getting very little of it. Um, here is the site in red. And what are the changes that make new controls? George Street becomes pedestrianised and Macquarie Holdings are putting in, putting in a major pedestrian link from Martin Place to Chifley Underground. And so this changes the dynamic and re-centres the heart of the commercial area of, of Barangaroo. And we argued strongly and succeeded in having all, all the uh, navigation, underground and above ground, aligned so that when you went down, you knew where you were heading, and also achieved two major void areas with natural light uh, to, to give you uh, a great experience as you enter into the train station. So this train station will be special because buildings are built over it that create great spaces to enter the train stations from. And here you see in section the JPW building to the right, our building to the left, and the Grimshaw work to the bottom, with the non-ticketed pedestrian link and the ticketed uh, platform area of the, of the buildings and, of course, the Ross and Row building, which guided our work uh, in the middle. With open space, um, again, we, we, we realised that Martin Place 
is closed. It has great sky. And also, Hunter Street is the point at which the city changes. It's where the colonial topographical grid meets the modern grid. And interestingly enough, all the buildings on Hunter Street are different to the buildings elsewhere. But the controls didn't do that. The controls had one size fits all and didn't reflect the fine grain of the city. So in the build form, um, we, we summarised it in these diagrams, if I can get them up. Here we go. So we, 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 we respected the solar access planes. We looked at the, the, the building opposite uh, 39 Martin Place, the Ross and Row building, and we said that it should guide the podium heights. And um, we made uh, the 39 Martin Place, where you see two and four, have a strong interstitiary space, a sort of void space, so that the top of the podium stopped and the tower started. And we also um, have zero setbacks uh, on both sides for different reasons. On Hunter Street, because they all have it, and it's an appropriate gateway to the modern city. And on Macquarie Street, on Martin Place, to create these threshold conditions so that the city, the build form, reflected the hierarchy of streets and blocks, Martin Place being more important than the other streets nearby. And you can see, you can see the side setbacks on the elevations on Hunter and, and Mount Place drawings, but I can't change the slide. So these drawings summarise a couple of the ideas. On the left, the zero setback uh, JPW Tower, reflecting the uh, uh, Roger Stoke Harbour Partnership and the Foster's Towers. And on the right, and it forms the threshold to the precinct. And on, on the right also, our tower, which is the only tower that can be at that height because all the other towers to the south will overshadow the park, which, we, which we, we, we believe shouldn't be done and won't be done. So that therefore you get a southern threshold, um, allowing the build form, enabling the build form to reflect the significance of Martin Place. Um, on this slide, you see the Rosson Road building. And, and when you're moving from south to north, there's no question. You see this building and you know you've arrived at Martin Place. The building on the left is the one we're demolishing. Not a great building. And it has this building, this fortress-like quality. So in depression years, putting your money in the bank meant, meant putting it in safe hands, and nothing could be safer than a place you can't get into. And this was the character of that building. And we, we, we knew, and the city wanted, a building opposite that was interactive, which was, um, which, oh, sorry, before I go there, and our, our proposition was that the two buildings, our urban design proposition was the two buildings a hundred years apart should speak to each other and together form a significant public open space. Just as significant as the cenotaph area because again, it would be defined by these buildings in conversation between Castle and Elizabeth, just as the buildings in conversation form uh, the cenotaph area between George and Pitt. So we saw this as an opportunity with the, with the metro to make a hierarchy of spaces within Martin Place, this being the commercial heart of it, linked with the transport. How did we make this building uh, a monumental building when we needed full accessibility, transparency, access to the train station, visibility down to the void, retail and commercial entries? We used this, the enormous structural challenges of transferring loads to the points where you could put the loads in the, tra in the underground tra uh, tram, uh, train system as monumental elements. Yes, when you look at them straight on, you see more glass, but when you look at them from an angle, they become quite monumental. And this is a sketch of that idea, which became a more, more, more uh, real idea with this language extended, where the materials of 15 Martin Place the Ross and Row building become the same materials um, at the at the at the um, lowest part of the podium. The the the, the, the ceramic tiles and the colouring become our terracotta tiles, um, and also the articulation of the top of the podium becomes our articulation. Everything lining up, but a liquid contemporary language to the neoclassical Doric language of a hundred years ago, and making the tower a kind of conservatory structure held by the terracotta elements. 
And here you see front on the, the, the rhythm of the glass and the bronze aluminium forming these column-like structures over the strong base. And, the, and to run through the plans, this is the Elizabeth Street plan, which gives you the connectivity of the station, all the cores for the station and the tower above to the south, and also um, um, the commercial lobby entry and some retail. And you also see from Castle Street the monumental entry to, to the station, more retail, and, and of course the cores. A typical plan for the podium has the rhythm of the glass changing east and west, reflecting view opportunities and solar issues. And the typical, not the typical, the atypical special uh, top of podium, publicly accessible with magnificent views of Martin Place. And of course, directly opposite, the domed addition by JPW to the Rothson Road building. So there again, a sort of opportunity to engage with something special. And the typical plan of the tower with the curving forms and the special terracotta back connecting the spine of the building to the top and also producing these southern views, which you see here in section and in elevation. And notice how the top changes here on um, Elizabeth Street with the Rosson Road building on the right and the podium building on the left. Here on Castle Ray Street, top changes. And the top change is because it, it is designed around solar access. And so while it's symmetrical from our place, on each side, the solar rays determine the shape. It wasn't just the solar rays because we had to manage the mechanical plant to fit within the envelope. You'll notice the steep splay of the building and how we've managed it to carry the, the terracotta all around, spiraling around, and fit all that stuff in and still create a distinctive uh, element at the top of the building, which you see here. Another characteristic was, th there's no doubt, the MLC Plaza eroded Martin Place. This building, we think, um, contains Martin Place and provides a visual context and a wall context, which enhances the um, scale and character of the MLC podium, primarily because it connects across to the other side and has a, a very vigorous language to counterbalance the idiosyncrasy of the commercial traveler's curved building. So we think you'll never see that building again as being a sort of, let me say, a slightly weird building because we have similarly weird things next to it and it makes it in, more, more uh, in, in scale. And here we see the Elizabeth Street corner. And, and um, looking up on, Martin, uh, on Elizabeth Street, you see the spine going up, the conservative-like tower the elements, uh, the smaller scale elements, uh, capturing view from Martin Place, and these special um, transfer columns and, and special um, uh, place atop the podium. And, and, the, and the plant room at the top, which you see in one form here, another form there. And, and to conclude this idea of threshold, that now you not only have the Ross and Row building you have this building, we think, which tells you that it, it makes, uh, makes that threshold that you're entering a civic space. It connects with the building opposite. In fact, the podium connects all the way to the former Qantas building on Chifley Square and, and to the building to the north. And similar threshold idea to the Castle Ray Street side. And of course, we hope we make a beautiful space that gives you two significant spaces in Martin Place, already a great place, but with the symbolic and commercial centres expressed differently. So to conclude my presentation, I thought I would go back and I've, please forgive me if you know this building and you know, and you know this story. But in 1988, to commemorate the Bicentennial, this was built as a monument to the country. And I um, selected um, Iman Stellas to create a work of art to the feet of the dome. And I have to say there were a couple of ideas, three or four ideas that um, I didn't understand. But when Imans came to me with this idea, I thought it was outstanding. And why did I think that? And why is it relevant today? Well, it's a propeller that's turning. It's in motion. And on the right, the propeller is made out of the motives of our pre-colonial times, the earth colors and the symbols of place of our Aboriginal heritage. 
and coming into that heritage is an androgynous convict figure, which you see quite menacingly, in a way, as part of our history, but also is our post-colonial, post-1788 history. And that's one part of the propeller. And the other part of the propeller is the science of colour. And together they rotate around an empty space, and that empty space is Australia. And Newman's proposition is that with our cultural heritage and with the, with the foundations of science, we can make this country something special. So thank you. Another round of applause for Alec, please, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> and keep that applause going because it wouldn't be a Brickworks event without the insightful questions of Stephen. Please make him welcome to the stage, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Tim. And thank you, Alec, for your presentation. I thought I'd start, um, you talk about place and the importance of place and quite a number of times you talked about the detail of those particular places that you're creating. How, how do you feel that you translate your interest in place and that kind of detail to those larger scale projects? How does the, that level of interest and specificity inform the greater project? Um, well, that's a great question. It's at the heart of a way of thinking about design. Is that on? Hold there? it close. Hold the thing close to your mouth. Sorry, much better. Um, when you take the view that you can be inspired by uh, places and you have the view that the language of architecture, both in the past and what you can make in the future, is free. It's not about um, pro producing a commodity, producing a style that you put all over the world, but it's about um, engaging with the social, economic and physical context of a place. Um, the translation of place into architecture is, is, I think, a very exciting journey because you can, you can speak in many voices. You can use and develop new languages. Here we saw innovations in brick, uh, in glass, um, and in timber. And, and so all these things are a freedom, is what I would say, and, and part of the joy of, of designing, not only in one field of architecture, but also, if you like, urban design and product design and so on. So I think that um, that's my answer to your question, if I understood you correctly, which is that place translates into design if you can let go of something to do with yourself and start thinking about what makes a better community, a better world, a better place, and see how you can use, use your, your skills to provide site-specific solutions. I, I see it like a good musician who might be known for one thing, like playing jazz, but is actually a brilliant uh, Bach pianist or rock musician. So it's this idea of embracing all the media that's available. Sure, but you would still have your own sound, your own voice, well, and how you, how you translate those things. So, so what is the sound? The sound is around um, the integration of um, a, a, a view about how to use materials, how to make really sensible plans, how to um, make the buildings last. Uh, we, would, we would strive to make buildings um, culturally appreciate, and we would say that they materially appreciate as well by being um, uh, deeply engaged with what we can do with um, the circumstances we find ourselves in as designers. So I think that that, um, that rigor, I'll call it rigor, um, defines all of our buildings, even though they may appear to be different mm. and are often done by multiple hands working on the same project or within the office. You, the projects you showed are also for quite different clients. And so you have to explain your thoughts and ideas of place and of detail and materiality to these people. Can you give us a bit of insight into how you do that? How do you explain to these clients who may or may not understand what you're doing and maybe enlighten us a little about 
some of that dialogue when it is positive and when it's maybe not so positive and how you deal with that? Well, I, I think the first thing to say is um, to do a little bit with empathy because it's important to put yourself as much as you can into the uh, mind of the other person and what drives their interests um, and what is their understanding uh, and their lens, if you like, will be different to yours. So engaging and empathising and developing a shared view about what could be done and, and if you like, collaborating uh, and and really, it may not be our idea, it might be our client's idea, it might be one of our colleagues in a junior position in our practice that somehow brings to, to this project, if you like, um, a way that we think works best for the client and works best, best with our values. So I think it's a, um, I think one of the most interesting parts of being a designer is the conversation, is the, are the precepts that people have that they bring to the design problem how to talk through those precepts, how to arrive at something which is shared and which um, really expresses truthfully uh, your values and your, your, if you like, your ethics. So I think um, that, that, that is the challenge because everybody's different. Mm. Okay, so, so developing that kind of rapport with the client. Let's talk, for instance, about Barangaroo, mm -hmm. a tough client pushing you for certain budgetary constraints on that particular project. How did you resolve the perhaps difficulties of working with that kind of process? And enlighten us a bit more about why it was selected to be a timber building. Was that your choice or was it their choice or how was that driven? Um, well, um, I'll start with the last question first. <laughs> um, I don't really know who came up with it first because Jeremy Thompson... Uh, Jonathan and I were in constant conversations about why we're using concrete. And I, I'm pretty sure we said, why don't we make it a timber building? Mm. But maybe Jeremy said it. What I do know is that Jeremy uh, wanted a timber building. So I can't really say who the author of the first idea was. But we took it further, I think, than, than, than anyone had thought of together with the client. And Jeremy championed it within, within the... Uh, organisation then this We had to prepare uh, options. We always had the concrete option and the timber option. We, we always had to argue for the timber option. And, and then Lisa's sustainability uh, mission policy um, did allow us to have that conversation. So, and, and so that was possible. And to their credit, they decided to go with the timber option and took those risks. Um, and yes, they are a tough client. Um, they have and I think this is an industry problem, they have unreasonable and unsurable conditions of contract, for example. And they have um, a, a very demanding um, uh, deadlines and timelines. And this, this goes to shape the way we have to practice as well. And we have to work with those or, as we do, spend many hours and many, many tens of thousands of dollars with lawyers negotiating the agreements. Um, having said that, we try and set up a fair and reasonable way for us to do our best work. That's our real objective. It's not, not just about the litigation and the risks. It's about setting up the conditions of employment that allows us in turn to be ethical to our employees and also allows us to do our best work. So in the end, it may surprise our clients that while we, we quibble about some of the conditions, that uh, we think it serves them as, as well. And those who know us, realise that and come back to us. No, I agree. Did the second building become easier as a consequence of the first? The second building was dead easy. The first <laughs> building was, um, let me say, a lost leader in every respect. Uh, like for a start, we did two buildings ten times. Uh, but the second building, um, when Lenley said, you've done the first one, therefore your fee's got to be half, we said we've done the first one and we know two things. One, the building will be cheaper to build and two, we know what it takes to design it and it takes just as much. Mm -hmm. So they understood that and we were able to do it more efficiently and, and also they, of course, loosened the, the wallet and we had you know, some more opportunities with the foyers and with, uh, with other elements. The client for Macquarie Street is a different sort of client. Have you had um, an interesting dialogue with them? Yes. Yes, there's uh, a lot. 
a lot to say about that process, which yes. is still underway. Anything you can enlighten us here about that or not? Well, I'll, I'll say this for Macquarie Holdings. They were very keen to do a fine building. They, they, they do um, believe in, 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 in the value of, of architecture and good design underpinning uh, social benefit, but also financial benefit. And, and uh, I think they had the capacity and culture to do that, and brilliant people, I might say, um, leading the project. Um, do we agree with everything they say and do? Uh, usually not on the contractual side. Mm. But apart from that, it was fine. <laughs> and we're still friends. We'll leave it at that. Tell me about the curve. The curve in glass and in concrete has crept into these later projects, particularly starting off in more subtle ways, perhaps at Barangaroo, then at Macquarie Street, now at Martin Place. Is that something that is conscious or has crept in or how, how is that working? Oh, it's... it's um well, we don't just do curves. But, uh, no, 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 but it's, a, it's an interesting thing that yeah. hasn't been quite as apparent in your work. No, it's but it's now evolving, and I'm just curious to know a little more about that. Um, it, 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 in a way, f for me, it started at Barangaroo, um, but also it's, so, um, it's such a seductive way to bend light to, to reduce the impact of scale and bulk to... Uh, feather the public domain to lead from one place to another, to um, uh, to find, in the case of the um, circular key building, to create, as I say, as I said in the talk, um, this this way of subdividing apartments and create bay windows and and to resolve geometries that are diagonal to, to maximise views. Um, I I, th I think it's um, it's not uh, a trademark. It's not. Um, you know, the, um, the, the, the Borromini uh, era. It's, go it's definitely just to be used judiciously where it works. Mm. And also the uh, innovation that the glass technology people, uh, nor um, northeast and northwest glass in China, uh, worked very hard to achieve to minimise distortion and other mm. things. So it's technically interesting. I knew you'd have a good answer. Well, I'm not <laughs> sure if it's a good answer. Uh, the reason why I'm resisting saying anything much about it because... Um, as you can see in our work, if you look over the 30 years or so, 40 years, 35 years, um, you'll find many different, um, many different expressions, many different ways Absolutely. of working. And, and I think that's essential is probably not the right word. I think there are other ways of doing it, definitely other ways of doing it. But it's one way of um, considering the artefact as part of something else, not, not self-referential or part of a personal history only, or part of some kind of esoteric architectural history, but actually tied to something greater, which we all share. Mm. So it's seen as something in relation to something else. That idea of design is relative, not absolute. You touched upon that body of work then. So let's talk about the practice. Yes. You know, since being a sole practitioner, doing terrace houses until now with... Um, a Maybe series of partners, four other partners, yeah. and doing these urban scale projects. Can you explain a little about how you feel you've evolved and how the practice has evolved and become what it is today? Yeah, so that's, that's a really important question in a way because I think I can say with, um, uh, with complete um, uh, evidence to support it that from the start... Um, the idea of practice was founded on, on, on an ethical relationship to others and, and um, of course it was just me in a basement, an uh, unrenovated basement, but for, for many years. But as the work grew, the size of the practice grew, but the people who, who came to the practice were always exceptional people and that, that in itself is, um, is really something that uh, I feel privileged to be part of. And of course, as the, as the work grew, the collaborative concept of design, I would say, was uh, with me from the start. It's kind of in my DNA. And I think um, has grown into the practice where 
Yes, there are individual voices and voices that are the future of the practice, but at the same time, it's a, it's a, a genuine conversation, a genuine co collaboration where we try and make sure that collectively uh, we try and deliver the best we think um, for the design. And yes, it does require leadership. The leadership now can vary, but the leadership is, is still there. And, and it's not just the directors of leader. For example, uh, Diana Tasevska, who's not uh, uh, with us tonight, but she, she played a, an instrumental role in all the Barangu projects for those who, who know those projects. And we have talent all the way down. No, there's been a definite evolution yeah. over the years of the practice. Perhaps um, in closing, I wonder if you have some thoughts on what the future of architecture and of the profession might be particularly in these unusual times? Well, I think, I think um, if I look at the trajectory of design in this country, it's generally been getting better and better. It's becoming recognised for its value and I think it will continue to be better and better. In fact, you know, this, this, this sort of uh, emerging uh, health crisis um, masks a fundamental climate crisis. And um, I go back to the theme that we should be thinking of the biosphere of all living beings, understanding how we can, um, I will say, manage, even control the human tendency to, to trash the world. So I think that as designers, we should think carefully about how we act. Uh, it, this doesn't happen, of course, but in, 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 a, in a sort of, uh, almost allegorical sense, um, the idea is to do yourself out of a job, meaning that it's designed, it's built, it's never built again. And so that is um, uh, to do with um, a, a philosophy of thinking that respects the fragility of the resources we use to design economically with purpose and to uh, try and work through advocacy and through your own work to uh, turn the tide around from the values and the drivers that have basically trashed the world, as I said. So I think that's, that's a great time for design if you want to look at it on the bright side because while the past is not the future, there is always a coincidence of monumental changes in the expressive elements of culture underpinned by massive changes in, in technologies, in uh, economics, in geopolitical events, things like that. So we've got all those happening. There's, this is no doubt happening um, with, a, with an existential threat that has never been seen before. And so I think it's a, it's, a, it's a time to be, for anyone in any profession, it's time to be alert to that and to put everything you can to the effort of making the generations that follow have the place that we, we enjoyed and not a worse place. Alec, thank you very much. Please thank Alec for this evening. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, I'd like to again thank Alec for his presentation this evening. I'd like to thank Tim and Stephen for their contribution. Thank everyone who joined us tonight on live stream. As I mentioned, this is our new speaker series called In Detail, so please keep an eye out in your inbox for our future events. Thank you again for joining us. Please keep safe, and we'll see you again soon. Thank you.